time to go. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Is this working? No, not too well. I'm going to say Maria says all right, we will use the microphone. Uh, so I'm Kevin Hardigan. I'm from Perkins School for the Blind. And at Perkins, I have two distinct roles. I am the tour guide. And about 50% of the hundreds of tours I do every year, I do because of Helen Keller. People come to Perkins because Helen Keller, who Jackie is going to be portraying today, went to our school, and she is our rock star. <laughs> yeah. The other part of my job is I'm the director of volunteers and I have a thousand volunteers every year at Perkins and many of them are lions. Um, so I owe a great debt to Melvin Jones for founding the lions and to Helen Keller for inspiring them. So I am sitting here between two legends I feel like a baseball fan sitting between Babe Ruth and Ted Williams. <laughs> I'm the Babe. Our, <laughs> our golfer between Jack Nicholas and Arnold Palmer. So, uh, I'm Jack, by the way. <laughs> I'm Jack. You picked the wrong one. My reputation is at, at Perkins is of someone who likes to talk and never shuts up. But today, I want to ask a couple of questions and sit back and listen to answers from Helen Keller and Melvin Jones. Well, uh, if there is time at the end, we will open it up to questions from the group. So that would be fine for any one of the five of us. <laughs> Kevin, Ken, Melvin, Jackie, or Helen. And I'm going to start with Helen. And I'm going to just ask her to tell us a little bit of, she wrote a, one of the most famous memoirs of all time, The Story of My Life. And there have been plays and movies made about her early life. But she's sitting here, so I want to hear from Helen the story of your life up to 1925. Thank you, Kevin. Probably the biggest thing that ever happened to me was Annie Sullivan. The day Annie arrived at my home, I have always considered my soul's awakening. Those of you who know my story know I was a bit of a tyrant. I hit, I kicked, I punched, because nobody could understand me. I couldn't get my point across. And then I met Annie. And I didn't quite like that she was making me do things that I did not quite want to do because my family let me do whatever I wanted to. So when we moved out to the cottage, I had no choice. Teacher had to teach me everything. My family was quite surprised within a month's time how well behaved I was when I spent so many years misbehaving, let's put it that way. <laughs> you know, Annie spent all that time putting things under my hand and I just repeated it. I knew how to do that. Most kids know how to do that. Until my brain finally connected and I put it together about water. You know, I could talk before I got sick. I could see before I got sick. So it was a matter of just really learning how to formulate words. And once I realized what Wawa was, and my brain connected it, I wanted to know everything. Many of you know how Smart I am. Yes, I was very smart. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I couldn't stop learning. I wanted to know everything. Because at one time I could see it and then I couldn't. And how many of you in the room have read my book? One, 
two, three, four, five. Have you read more than one book? <laughs> I know you have. <clears throat> I wrote 12 books in my lifetime. I would encourage you to try to get a hold of more than just The Miracle Worker, or the official title is The Story of My Life. When I learned that a little gal from Sweden had learned to speak and was deaf and could not, he could not hear and could not see, I had to learn it because, by gosh, if she knew how, then I was going to know how to. And many of you probably know that story where I spent <laughs> countless hours, days, months, years, weeks learning to speak. Took class to learn how to talk. Spent many, 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 many years with my hands-on Annie, feeling the vibration in her throat and my hand on her mouth and my finger on her nose so I could get a grasp of what it meant to talk. And I didn't stop there because once I learned, I wanted to keep learning and I wanted to keep going to school. And that's why I wanted to go to college. College was difficult. I don't know what I would have done without Annie Annie redid every single one of my lessons in Braille so that I could study and pass my classes. And remember, Annie was almost blind herself and had gone through many surgeries to regain useful sight. And it, that was very taxing on her because she spent, she was in classroom with me every minute of every day and at night she would sit and she would redo my lessons in braille so that I could study. Now Kevin knows this, when I did have to test in class, Annie was not allowed to be in the classroom with me. Not allowed to be in the building? In the building at all, yes, in the building at all, just to make sure that I wasn't cheating. I did, I did graduate cum laude. Um, I know about five <coughs> languages. How many of you know more than one language? Oh, how many languages do you know? I speak German. Oh, German. It's oh. because mm. Deutsch. Yeah. Bin mm -hmm. born in Deutschland. <laughs> I am, many of you may or may not know, I'm very vocal. Once I learned and my brain picked up so many things, I wanted to be a part of all of it. Then the NAACP, women's suffrage, you name it. I was involved with it. Politics didn't scare me. I wanted to be a part of that. <clears throat> and you know, Annie and I traveled extensively working for the American Foundation for the Blind. I've been to so many countries and this goes a little bit beyond 1925, but I've been to so many countries that most of you probably have never even heard of, just traveling for the foundation, raising money, and awareness for people who are blind. We're not stupid. We just have a disability, like all of those of you in this room with a pair of glasses on. And we just wanted to be like everybody else. We wanted to learn, and we wanted to do things we had a lot of ability, even though we couldn't see or hear. And we used that to our advantage. But you know, all these trips I was on, <clears throat> the, probably the best trip of my life was the trip I made in 1925 yep. to Cedar Point. Which uh, means I'm going to take the microphone not away. Not yet. I'm going to have to okay. talk about that. <laughs> see? <laughs> Annie and I were actually in California. We were touring, of course, for the American Foundation. Annie was getting a little bit, she was sick. She was not having a very good time. And we decided that it was time to go home to Arkin and um, let her get some rest. But because the lions had been 
constantly on us and sending us letters and messages to say, please come, please come, please come, we decided we'd stop off in Ohio. So we stopped off in Ohio and went down to the Youngstown Lions Club and we had a great time down there. And as I had, they had been asking me to do, I agreed to let them take me up to Cedar Point so that I could talk to the lions. Now, there was a lion who drove us to Cedar Point. And unfortunately, on our way there, our car broke down. So I might not have made it to Cedar Point if we hadn't had someone come along and get us there. I almost missed my speech, but I finally got there and uh, they let me on stage as soon as I got there. And many of you know my talk. Who else in this world could share my vision, help the blind to be a better person, to just live a normal life? That's all we wanted to do, was to live a normal life. And I knew that if anyone could help me and keep this going and help us prevent reversible blindness, it was going to be the lions who could do it. So President Newman finally got me up there and I went on and Mr. Jones and I had a bit of a conversation and we enjoyed that. And uh, I got up on stage and I'm so very, very grateful for all of you for what you've done for lions and what you still do today for lions to help us reverse that blindness. You got a lot of work to do yet, but you're getting there. There's a lot of things that we've done and I'm gonna get stopped here pretty soon because I'm going beyond 1925 probably. But I had a good time at Cedar Point. I hope if none of you have ever been there, you go up and see it. They have a little sign outside the convention center that talks about Helen Keller and what Helen Keller did for Lions Worldwide. And uh, unfortunately, it was the only time I got to see my friend Melvin. We didn't really get to communicate much after that. But I always held the Lions in my heart and I'm very grateful for everything that you have all done for the deaf and the blind worldwide. Thank you. Every day on my tours, I say, Nobody could ever tell Helen Keller what to do. I just found out firsthand. <laughs> could never tell her she couldn't do anything. <laughs> so now I'd Nobody like. Nobody ever tells me that. I'd like to have Melvin tell his story up to that day at Cedar Point. Where did you come up with the idea? And tell us about yourself. By the way, he likes to talk too. Now you know that a Chicago salesman cannot sit. <clears throat> when he shares. <laughs> Helen, it's so glad to see you after, uh, you know, we really haven't had that much communication, have we? Likewise, my friend. Yeah. That's right. As all of you know, I was born out west. My father was on a military base. I was born on a military base out west. My father, unfortunately, uh, to uh, his discredit and uh, to, uh, I suppose, the American way of how we treated the Native American Indians, uh, was involved in one of the last uh, final roundups of uh, the various tribes out west, especially the Comanche Indians. And growing up on that post, I had an opportunity to uh, engage with the Comanche Indians, uh, the Utes and uh, uh, Arapaho and some other ones that uh, were, I guess, fighting against uh, the expansion of the United States. And I felt bad. And I thought to myself, what, what can I do uh, for these various tribes? We were taking their land. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, it started way back in colonial times as we pushed our way across the United States. We just kept pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing. Uh, you can imagine right here in good old Pennsylvania, uh, the Iroquois Nation, and, and there were various tribes that are no longer here. And I'm thinking, if I could serve in some way for humanity uh, to help and make it a better world when I leave than when I came in. 
and I, I think that was the beginning of my thoughts uh, as far as service to make it a better place when you leave. Uh, and uh, eventually, of course, you know, uh, I, I became a salesman of insurance. Uh, I suppose I was successful. Uh, probably some would say not, but uh, I thought that uh, uh, sales treated me well. And of course, uh, we started and we were engaged in the uh, Chicago Luncheon Group. And uh, let me make this very clear. I never would want to see Lions to be a good old boys club. And one of the reasons why I left the uh, uh, Chicago Luncheon Group I thought that they were self-centered, I thought that they were selfish, I thought they were conceited, and I thought that they were basically a good old boys club that wasn't doing anything in service for the community. And as far as I'm concerned, what is a service club? But to service humanity. Not a good old boys club, not a drinking club, not where we come together and we're all pals and drink beer. That's okay, but we are a service club, and that was my vision of the Chicago Luncheon Group, and that really did not turn out, and I was disillusioned, and of course, uh, with that uh, was the beginnings when I left with uh, Lions in 1917. And from the very beginning of our organization, I wanted to make very clear, Lions, very clear, we serve. Do you understand? We serve. We are servants to humanity. I wanted to make a, a better world for those various tribes out west. Never really had an opportunity to do that. But we've had an opportunity up until Cedar Point, 1925, to service 48 states. We only have 48 states. And of course, Canada. And we are growing. We are growing, and we are serving mankind. And I never want to hear any lion organization or clubs that are self-serving. I don't want to hear that. Okay? I, what I want to hear is you're out there in the community, and you know, when Helen came to Cedar Point, I was so excited. And her, her speech, her words were phenomenal. We all, we all know that. And, and she shared them this morning. Phenomenal. But that was just the beginning. And, and Helen lit the match that lit the candle, that lit the, the dynamite stick, that blew the whole thing open. And now we are involved more. Because before you see Helen, we were involved with the blind to a certain degree. Some of the organizations would help in certain areas uh, with blindness, but after her speech, she blew open the door, and now our service is unbelievable. And I want you to keep this up. Now one problem you're going to have, listen up Lions, okay? One problem is to bring in fresh talent. Do you know what I mean? What happens many times with service organizations? You'll have somebody come into your club, they get all excited, you see them for about a year or two, and then they're gone. And then you look over the age of your organization. You go to the conference, or you go to maybe district meetings, and look over the age. Are there any young people? Come on, are there any young people? Not too many. You know, not too many. That's right. And this, this is. There's one right back there. We do have one. Yes. Thank you. We we really need to concentrate on not only our service to the community, unselfish service. Okay. We need to concentrate on bringing in new members, young blood, that want to service humanity and make this a better world when you leave than when you arrived. Thank you. Um, so, Helen in her speech um, talked about being a capricious, 
beautiful young lady knocking on the door as opportunity, and she mentioned that there were other people knocking. Would you like to talk about some of the other possibilities that if Helen hadn't lit that match, the lions could have gone in a different direction? Well, you know, I have to stand. You understand, don't you? You know, before Helen came, we were in a predicament. We knew that we had a mission of service, but we really did not know exactly what direction we should go with that. I'm being honest. And there was arguments and there was debates, what we should do with our money, with our talents, with our abilities. You know the core beliefs of Lions. You should. You should have it memorized. But what direction should we go? And Helen comes along and she blows open this door and not only did she blow the door open in relationship to uh, the, the, the blind blindness, but she opened the door to service on many, many areas and many fronts, uh, along with various uh, uh, handicapped situations. <coughs> One that I think about uh, is the program that we have had with cataracts. And as of 1925, I believe it was close to a million uh, individuals uh, worldwide that we have helped with cataract surgery. This is just one area. Uh, this is, it has nothing to do with leadership, uh, with uh, the dog program, with the uh, glasses program. You can go on and on and on with the various programs. But keep thinking. Don't let it die. Throw, throw out there your thoughts and so forth of what we can do to continue. And, and then it just went into other areas with our youth. Uh, you know, to help out our, our young people, but uh, she just really blew the door open and, and there's just so many programs because of Helen Keller that we probably would spend two or three hours here and I'm sure you don't want to listen to Melvin Jones for two, three hours. If you do, I'll, I'll stand up here and talk. <laughs> so Helen, I talk about Helen all the time and she was involved in many, many things from civil rights to legal rights to women's rights. Uh, she's one of the first people in the world to openly speak up to Adolf Hitler. I personally think the most important contribution Helen made was that speech in Cedar Point and getting the lions. Absolutely. But I want to talk a little bit with Helen about her other achievements okay. after that date. Lions really got me going. After Cedar Point, I did a lot of traveling. As Kevin said, when Adolf Hitler decided he was going to burn all those wonderful books I read, I wrote, excuse me, I wasn't very happy about that. And I had to make sure he knew about it. You know, I'm never one to back down, so I had to write him a letter and just let him know that I didn't care if he burned my books because you can burn a book but you can't burn a memory and he could burn that book but the ideas and the principles were still going to be there they were still going to mean everything to the people who read and everything people to people who have free will and I also told him that if he was going to continue in the manner that he was, that he was going to suffer fate worse than hell. And we all know what happened with Adolf Hitler, and I would have to say I was right. <laughs> Back to Mr. Jones. You mentioned that often social groups like this, service groups, end up aging out. I have to say I was most impressed this morning at breakfast when I looked around the room and didn't see just young adults. Yes. I saw children, which gives me hope. Um, I have lots of lions who volunteer at Perkins. I do not want to leave out all the lionesses who volunteer at Perkins and the Leos who come and help out with our students. So 
I have great hope that the Lions are not going to, I but I too. want you to talk a little bit more about some other things that the Lions have contributed and how they are serving, if you can. Sure. That was just a, a, a comment that I made that I have seen not only with uh, service organizations, but with historical societies. Uh, I noticed uh, as I travel across the country, any type of groups that we're, we're always faced with the, the, uh, the possibilities, a challenge, you know, of bringing in young people uh, that's going to replace us in the future. And that's extremely important. So it's not just lions. Uh, it's, it's all the service groups. And you have to remember now, in 1917, uh, the service groups, uh, that was not a novel. I mean, uh, every small community uh, in the 48 states in 1917 had some type of service program. Uh, but, you know, uh, I, I think what helped me was uh, St. Clair's book, Babbitt. Have you read the book, Babbitt? You read it. Do you know what Babbitt means? Years ago. Yeah, well, Rachel basically... College. Unfortunately, he wrote that book as a satire against lions and service clubs. Uh, it was a satire that they are, uh, let me just say, selfish and self-centered groups. And uh, that was a bestseller, <laughs> Babbitt. If you get a chance to read the book, read it. And I never wanted that with lions. And I wanted us to progress far beyond even in relationship uh, to Helen's speech uh, that magnified Stop and think for a moment. What else do we do as lions? What does your organization do other than help with the blind projects with the blind? What do you do? We help. Uh, uh, we help people with uh, hearing aids. Uh, we also um, are big on um, helping the people um, prevent dia um, or diabetes. Uh, we also are big with the youth. We have a very good rapport with our um, Leos. Um, um, the hungry, uh, we help out our um, food food pantry monthly. <coughs> I'm glad you brought that up. Food pantry. How many of you, your clubs, do something with the food pantry? Seriously. That is good. That is good. That is extremely important. We have right now a problem, and if I jump ahead, we have a problem with homeless, homeless people. Uh, I went to St. Louis, uh, my beautiful wife, who's a professional golfer. Did you know that uh, Mrs. Jones is a professional golfer? You did not know that. No. In, in fact, she puts a golf ball on my head as I lay on the ground, and she tees off. <laughs> No, not really. Okay. <laughs> but we went to St. Louis, and I, and I spoke at, at a Lions function there in St. Louis, and we went underneath these bridges, remember, honey? And I'm thinking, look at all those tents. Look at all those tents and sleeping bags. Homeless in St. Louis. Hundreds of them. Close to where we live, Tent City. Now, you're not going to expect this from Melvin Jones, but my wife will verify it. I went to her, and I said, I'm going to go live in Tent City. Have fun. <laughs> and so for, I don't know how long it was, I bought a tent and a sleeping bag, and I went down, and I lived with the homeless. Wow. Try it. You know, try it. Now, I have to admit, every once in a while, I go home for a shower. <laughs> and dinner. And dinner. Okay. Right. But I just, you know, we really need to reach out. And you were asking, what else do we do? But uh, I think this, uh, the food pantry, anything we can do with homeless and your programs, uh, with your money, okay? And it's not our money. You understand that. Absolutely. Somebody came up and said, I don't know, we got $175,000 in the bank, blah, blah, blah. What, what do you have $175,000 in the bank for? It needs to be out in the community. Get that money out there. <laughs> you know, please. But uh, what other, I'm going to ask one other person right here, this intelligent-looking gentleman. What else? Does, what does your club do? Well, we do just about anything that takes to help our community. Okay, very good. How about over here? Right here. Uh, we have several people in our 
in our club that are environmentally inclined, okay? So uh, we've done some rather extensive projects. I mean, monthly we do a recycling program, but that's, that's okay. Uh, a big project we did, we cleaned up the riverbed of a river for about 20 miles and made a, a river that at one time was, well, we got Amish involved, they brought teams of horses in, cut trees out and drug it out and, and uh, that was quite a project. And now another project we've got going is a milkweed project. For the, for the monarch butterflies, okay, and uh, we have a nursery raising 3,500 milkweed plants that we're going to be planting and, and uh, helping the monarch butter, butterflies to I like us. that. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I, I just like to get some of your feelings on that. I'm going to turn this back over here, but... Uh, I like that because you're right. It all, we're, I'm from well. I went through Ohio, and they have a problem with milkweed in Ohio because they spray along the roads and so forth and fence roads and well, kill. We, we live on a lake, okay. We live in Pennsylvania. Look, on the other side of the, of the lake is Ohio, okay. So that's that's where we are, okay? and that's that whole area through there. Uh, but you're from Chicago. One of, the, one of the guys who does this is from Chicago, and he's, he's, he can remember as a child watching hundreds of thousands of monarch butterflies come on their northern migration to up into Wisconsin. <laughs> and and um, that doesn't happen anymore, no. so that's, that's one of the reasons we do it. Okay, thank you. I'll give this back to Helen because this, again, she challenged the Lions to be Knights of the Blind, but Helen was by far not just interested in helping blind people. She was involved in everything, and I want to ask her to kind of go into the present time and talk about, you know, what would have been Helen Keller doing today as far as <coughs> the environment or what she was involved in everything, so do you want to? Sure. Yeah, you know, I gotta stand up because he stood up. Mm -hmm. I can't let him outdo me. <laughs> <laughs> he likes to talk a lot. There's so much I could share with you about my life and what I did. <clears throat> Most of you that can see and hear probably can't imagine doing half of what I did in my lifetime. Most of it was because I wanted to show that I didn't have a disability. It was just a little something that was in the way. And I'll talk about the rest of it in a minute. <clears throat> but I was in Hollywood, did you know that? I starred in a documentary about my life. I, the Hollywood movie didn't go very well. I had hoped to support myself off of that. But it did lead into a vaudeville tour. How many of you know what vaudeville is? There's a few in the room who still do. So I was in vaudeville for four years, and I really enjoyed that. I think today, if Helen Keller were with us, she would be so proud of what you all do because you don't limit yourself to vision. You don't limit yourself to disabilities. You don't limit yourself to the environment. You do all of it. I understand you have a slogan today. Where there's a need, there's a lion. That's what a service organization is all about. And if I were still around today, I think I would love to be part of the Lions Clubs to be out there with you as much as possible, helping you with the wonderful work that all of you do, whether it's river cleanup, whether it's highway cleanup, whether it's helping the disabled and uh, buying, <coughs> excuse me, buying a, 
a dog for a child who needs some help in a wheelchair or um, <coughs> cataract surgery for someone, helping with macular degeneration. There goes my voice. I better not talk too long. <coughs> I think Helen Keller would be very proud of what you all do today and would want to be as much a part of that as possible. <coughs> Even though they didn't talk very much. Um, <coughs> Thank you, Melvin. <coughs> you may or may not know this. <coughs> One of Helen Keller's final appearances in public was in 1961 in Washington, D.C., where she received the National Medal of Freedom. The very last thing that she did, and it was also on behalf of Wines International, and I think that she was so proud of that because everything she did in her lifetime, what meant the most was what she got you to do. Because without you, we wouldn't have almost eradicated river blindness. <coughs> Without you, we wouldn't have almost eliminated trichoma off the face of the earth. We still got three years on that one. We're gonna get it done. Um, I, I would like to think if Cal Helen Keller was with us today, she would be out giving speeches <clears throat> on behalf of Lions to help bring members in because of what we do and what it means. You all know what it means to be flying and you know how good that feels when you help someone out. That's what it was all about for Helen. <clears throat> Anything she could do to help someone is what she wanted to do. <coughs> None of it was about her. It was about helping somebody else. And that was how she saw her lifetime and what she saw as what she needed to be doing and which is partly why she didn't let her vision and her, her lack of hearing stop her from doing absolutely anything because she knew it wasn't going to be a problem for her because she was adamant about doing everything that she could do. I'm glad you mentioned the uh <laughs> visit to Washington in 1961. Helen met eight presidents of the United States. I love that in most of the pictures... Grover Cleveland to JFK. Grover <clears throat> Cleveland to JFK. Um, Republicans, Democrats, some, <laughs> some she loved and supported and then disagreed with and fought against. Teddy Roosevelt. <laughs> <laughs> but nothing she did was about politics it was about service it wasn't a republican service or a democratic service it was service to people she met with churchill nehru um, charlie chaplin she danced with martha graham would you like to dance you don't have to speak um, <coughs> melvin and i can dance but again, like Helen, the tradition of the Lions is the same way. I mean, it's a group where you sit with people at dinner and you don't know whether they're a Republican or a Democrat or a liberal or a conservative. It's about service. It's about helping people. And right now, since we have a few more minutes, are there any questions that anybody would like to oh. Yeah, This is very important. I'm glad this information was brought up. <laughs> One thing, a, a cardinal rule among lines is you don't talk about politics. And I've been in some groups where the group broke up because of Democrats and Republicans and they get talking about politics and before long you got, you got it's just terrible. So we don't do politics and lines. Do all of you understand? Is that very clear? Yeah, you don't do it. We're to help and to serve. Republicans, Democrats, Independents, it doesn't matter. And that's extremely important. And another one is religion. All right? And I know there's groups that they get big fights over whether you're a Baptist or a Methodist or a Catholic or whatever. You, we cannot do that in Lions. Uh, you probably think I'm scolding you, but I can do that because I'm Melvin Jones. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Yes. You just need to nod. Was that the entire length of the speech you gave today? Okay. I, there's a reason I'll explain to you later. Okay. Right? The, I just found out last week, talking to Jackie on email, that the American Federation for the Blind has a different speech, a longer one. Oh, and we have never seen it anywhere else. She asked me for my copy from Perkins, and it's the identical it's the one that she's movie. always used. But there is a longer version. My best guess is maybe someone at, for a book or something asked Helen to write comments on their speech, and that got somehow mixed into the speech itself. We don't know. But there is another longer version. But that's the one we both agree she gave. Yes? I have a question. Helen, when you got out of the cottage with uh, Ann Salomon and you were brought home after the two weeks, everything seemed like very smooth and then you acted up on the table again. Was that uh, to test Ann Salomon or was that uh, because you didn't want to, what you what got taught or? Uh. Why did you do that? I was so excited to be back with my mom again. And I knew what I got by with before. So you tried it again? So I tried it again to see how far I could get. <laughs> and unfortunately, Annie wouldn't have it. And by then, I just loved Annie to death. So that's why I acted up again, because I wanted to see where my boundaries were. What could I get by with, and what couldn't I get by with? Right here. I have a question. Oh, I'll count. Oh, no. You want to go somewhere else? Nope. Go right ahead. <clears throat> How would Helen feel about a little gadget like this today? Okay. It's a Braille, it's, it's a Braille display. My, my friend Kevin. I'm right here. I'm right here, my friend. You can't read. It's Braille. I know. Yeah. Helen Keller would be so thrilled to have a machine like this. Think about when she was in college. Oh, absolutely and what had to be done for her to study and be able to take tests and to be able to pass to even graduate cum laude. Can you imagine how much more she would have been able to do if she'd had her own braille writer and could have done it herself? Oh, not her, but Annie. If Annie could have had this braille writer to very quickly, and not painstakingly the way she did it, but very quickly be able to recreate all of Helen's lessons in Braille with a machine like this. I don't know if any of you have ever seen one of these, but <clears throat> I have a very good friend in Ohio who carries one with him as well. These things are absolutely fabulous, and I know my friend Kevin here could tell you the same. <laughs> um, it's so much quicker, and because Annie, it was painstaking for her, for what, what they had back then, for her to um, redo everything in Braille for me. Um, she would have been in heaven to have had one of these. Well, this, Thank you, my friend. And it does say on it, welcome Helen Keller and Melvin Jones to the 94th Annual State <laughs> Lions Convention. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much, Kevin. And I can take this. Yes, sir. I, I want to just add to that, Kevin. I know for a fact that Helen would have one of those. She would have a iPhone with GPS yes. on it, and she would be first in line oh, yeah. to drive the Google car. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I would test it for She would have her own website. I would test it for her. Yes, it would. And it would be totally accessible to blind and yes. deafblind. Yes, sir. Uh, Melvin, in 1917, you decided you wanted to form a service organization. Why did you, or how did you come up with the name Lions? Excellent question. What does a lion stand for? Liberty, Liberty. Liberty. in our nation's safety. Liberty. Intelligence. Liberty. Liberty. I meant. What else? In in intelligence. 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 Oh, okay. Pride. 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 What is it? Pride. Pride. No. Our, our nation's safety. Yeah. A lion stands for strength, and a lion out uh, in uh, the the natural, the wild, they have their. Their, their, their communities, but when they come together, a lion will protect, and a male lion will protect and serve uh, the family and the community with his life. And I wanted an organization because I was really disgusted with the, uh, you get that, don't you, with the Chicago Luncheon Group. 
of what they were. I wanted a, a, a service club that would get out there and do something and serve the community and, and put their, their talents and their abilities, am I correct? Uh, you know, for the for service. So I thought lion, you know, do we want to be lambs? <laughs> Snakes? <laughs> you know, turtles? No, we want to be a lion! Roar like a lion! And lions do what? They serve. So you so, came up with the name then? Well, our group did. Your group did that. Yeah, and what, what, is, what is basically our motto? We serve. We serve. And what is my personal motto? You cannot get very far until you start doing something for somebody else. You didn't think I had that memorized, but I did. Someone else over here had something. Other questions? That's all. Good group of lions out there. There. They are. I do have one question. Yes. When did Annie Sullivan come to you as a, you know, your teacher. At what age? Oh, okay. so Annie was 20 years old when she came to Tuscumbia. How old was Helen? Kelly? Helen was seven. seven. Wow. Just shy of seven. Yes. Even Annie, her, Helen, her entire life never called her Annie Solomon. It was always teacher. The whole entire time it was never Annie. It was always teacher. Because you know when she when she first learned what water really was. And she started going around the house and patented everything, wanting Annie to tell her what it what it meant, what it, how to spell it. Her mom. And then she touched Annie. She wanted to know who Annie was. And Annie spelled teacher. Ever since that day, it's always been teacher. It was never Annie. It was always teacher. Annie, uh, Annie was quite young. She actually, and I don't know how many of you heard Kevin yesterday, but she wasn't sure she wanted to go live with the Cowlers because she'd never done anything like that before. And she was a little bit afraid to do that. If it hadn't been for Laura Bridgman, Annie wouldn't have done it, and who knows where we would have been today as Lions. That's right. Wow. That's right. Yeah. I'm always amazed by those little, if that car broke down, if you hadn't fixed it, if, you know, Annie had decided not to go, there's so many little things that change history. And that's the case. Over here. How long did it take uh, Helen to, to begin to pick up on the sign language? Helen never knew sign language. Oh, really? No. She knew how to spell. spell. She knew the spelling. But the, the American Sign Language itself, she never learned. It was always, it was always, everything was always spelled to her. Good question. Just if you didn't know, um, Annie remained Helen's teacher for 49 years. Wow. They traveled the world together. She was still working with Helen on the day she died. In the back. Annie married. Annie got married to a man uh, named John, John Macy. Macy. Were there any children? No, and it, uh, I won't say it's an unhappy marriage. Um, he, John was a writer, and he actually helped Helen with the story of my life, her autobiography. Yes. He helped her write the book. Mm -hmm. uh, fell in love with Annie. Uh, they married. And John, I, I want to be nice, was really dumb. <laughs> he was jealous of me. He was jealous that Annie cared more about Helen than she cared about him. And the story is that one day he basically gave his wife an ultimatum. Helen or me, and he moved out shortly thereafter. They never divorced, they remained married. Um, when Helen first came to my school in 1956, my, the building we are in now, she went to school in our original building in South Boston. She vid visited the present Perkins in 1956 to dedicate the Keller Macy Cottage, which was named after her and Annie because Annie was Mrs. Macy. Um, even all her obituaries refer to her as Mrs. Macy. Um, but most people know her from the Miracle Worker, and therefore, eventually, Perkins named the building the Keller Sullivan. And that's who most people know her as, Annie Sullivan. Does anyone in the room, including Helen, know where the term the Miracle Worker came from? 
who called Annie the miracle worker first? It was a very close friend of Helen's, fellow you may know, Mark Twain. Mark Twain, Mark Twain referred, he said that Annie was the miracle worker. He also said that the two most important people of the, of the 19th century. 20th century. No, 19th. What was it? Was, it was, yeah, it was, it was Helen century. Keller and Napoleon. And Napoleon. Mm -hmm. He said they were the two most important people of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Any other questions? Excellent. Well, I hope you enjoyed our conversation. I know I did. If anybody's interested in the room and anybody's actually a pen trader, I do have my own personal pen for Helen Keller, and I'm, I'm selling them for $5, but the money is going to iResearch. So, but we hope you enjoyed it. We hope you got a little bit more information about Helen Keller and Melvin Jones and how it all came about. Thanks, everybody.